really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you um, and the audience you've put together um, for um, uh, this uh, this talk. Um, I'll um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as I'm talking and. Um, as Mark very kindly and generously said, um, this has been a, a um, body of work that I've been working on for a long time, um, how to use genetics to find new targets for treatment and critical care. Um, and I'll tell you about um, uh, specifically the implications in COVID. Um, not long COVID, um, uh, because we don't yet have really good data for um, for long COVID, um, you know, for obvious reasons, all the, all the same reasons that the you know, COVID trial is um, uh, uh, challenged with, of course, the fact that problem in genetics. Um, so uh, to start with, um, I thought I'd, I would just talk a bit about the um, pathophysiology of COVID um, and how our, our understanding of it evolved, um, starting from the paradigm in critical care medicine, which, you know, for, for problems like sepsis and ARDS, you know, it has been clear from animal models and clinical studies for many decades that it is usual for patients who are critically ill with infections to be suffering primarily from the effects of their own immune system um, damaging their organs. Um, but in those conditions, impossible, despite many phase two and three clinical trials, uh, impossible to intervene to change it. Um, so um, in COVID, quite quickly after the outbreak started, um, this study was completed. It was led by um, David Dorward, Chris Lucas, and Clark Russell here at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and they did hot autopsies um, on um, both critical, critical care patients and um, patients who died in the community from COVID. Um, and by hot, I mean they, they um, obtained um, consent and initiated the autopsies within four hours of death um, so that the, um, the tissues were as informative as possible. Um, now, I'm not a histopathologist and I may well be experts. In fact, I know there are some, uh, some on the line who are better capable of, of analysing these sorts of slides than me. So I'll tell you what David explained to me about these slides and um, uh, what I take from it. So this is a um, cross-section through a pulmonary arterial, um, and this is um, a similar arterial in longitudinal section. And um, this is just an H&E stain um, showing lots of inflammation, um, inflammatory cell nuclei infiltrating into the um, arterial and in the um, in the alveoli. Um, and here, uh, multiple different um, uh, stains uh, in use, but this one staining for MPRA, a myeloid um, uh, signature, um, shows what um, uh, David and his team are increasingly convinced are monocytes infiltrating into the, um, the wall of pulmonary arterioles. So whilst the diffuse alveolar damage that, that was reported in most of the autopsy studies is a common finding in patients who are um, critically ill with hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, this infiltration of monocytes into the blood vessel walls is not, um, wasn't present in every patient um, or every, at least every section um, that they took, um, but it is a very striking um, appearance and I think it's consistent with some of the information that we subsequently got from genetics. Um, so that um, you know, gives us a clue that um, as with the other forms of critical illness, the host immune system um, might well be playing a primary role in causing organ damage rather than a direct um, effect of the pathogen. Um, there's also a really interesting feature, um, which I didn't um, see coming, um, which um, is that there's a, there's a tissue specific tolerance to the virus, um, which um, uh, David's team identified. So this is a section through what David informs me is no, a normal appearance of ileum. Um, and he stained it um, with this brown stain is for SARS-CoV-2 um, spike protein. So, and um, this indicates the presence of viral protein being produced in these cells, um, but no inflammation at all. Same in liver, um, the viral protein is there, um, but there's no inflammation. Um, and in this um, uh, biliary epithelium, there's um, uh, an appearance consistent with cell-to-cell -cell spread, um, reaching this line of demarcation. Um, so putting all that together in all of the, um, I think it was 14 autopsies um, that were reported here, um, uh, the team counted up how often they detected viral RNA in a tissue, and that was very common. And in you know, all over the body, everywhere they looked for it, the viral RNA was detectable, even late in disease, um, and where they found inflammation, which is essentially only in the lung um, and an abnormal appearance in the spleen. Um, this is um, uh, every patient plotted individually by time from onset of illness to the post-mortem being carried out. And you can see that in these four highlighted cases who died in critical care, um, even though they're, you know, in this, in this case, more than 30 days from the onset of symptoms, um, the virus um, was all over the body in several of them, 
and again, uh, uh, inflammation restricted to the lungs. So there's something specific about the lungs um, that uh, makes that tissue susceptible to inflammation in COVID. And it's a, it's a well, at least the, the appearances are consistent with a host mediated organ damage. Of course, the next bit of information that we got um, to really, for me, essentially prove that, you know, with, with, with a sort of a robust causal inference um, was the signal from the, the um, recovery trial showing that dexamethasone was an effective treatment. So um, the genomic study, um, which uh, is really what I'm here to tell you about, um, as Mark said, is, is a long standing piece of work. I've, I've said we started in 2015, but Mark's absolutely right. Um, you know, we, did, we started doing this for flu um, in 2009. I started a study called Genesis. We looked at um, uh, patients critically with flu during the flu pandemic in Scotland. Um, I quickly learned that coming up with an acronym that restricts you to one disease in one country is very silly. Um, and in fact, in, in that um, uh, outbreak, we collaborated with Peter Openshaw and the Mosaic Consortium um, and using a candidate gene approach, only looking at one gene, um, found the first host gene um, associated in humans with um, susceptibility to flu, um, IFRM3. But really since 2015, genomic has been active, ethically approved and recruiting. Um, that it, it took a while to get started. Um, the acronym is, um, I've learned my lesson, it's much broader, genetics of mortality and critical care. Um, and um, is an, it's an open global collaboration. Um, this morning I had a, a um, a great call with a group in Hyderabad who are um, setting up recruitment to genomic. There's active recruitment happening in Ireland, Canada, Brazil, um, and uh, we're setting up now in Pakistan in 67 sites um, in collaboration with Rashan Hanif and Abhi Bean and their international network um, and um, a whole team of doctors in Pakistan who are leading their own study. And the intention there is that we'll inevitably in genetics, everyone always wants to um, link their data together and, and um, uh, uh, get the best chance of seeing um, the strong signals. And of course, um, the whole objective here is to get as fast as possible to the point where we can see genetic variants that are robustly associated with either susceptibility, which is really what I'm going to talk about now, um, to critical illness, or in the really long term, a much more difficult and potentially therapeutically more important question, um, mortality, the part of the genes that change your chance of dying once you're already critically ill. And as I've shown in this slide, the very first inclusion criterion that we put on the um, uh, protocol was uh, critical illness caused by SARS or MERS uh, or Ebola or other emerging infections. So when COVID hit, um, we were able to recruit literally the first patients um, in intensive care units uh, in the UK. Um, most of the data I will show you are from the UK. And the reason for that is that um, as in so many other um, aspects of clinical science during the outbreak, and um, because of the integrated um, cohesive healthcare system, uh, and the personal generosity and effort of um, doctors and research nurses across the whole country, um, the UK has been extraordinarily effective at recruiting patients into clinical studies. Um, and so um, that's where the majority of the data um, are coming from um, in the genomic study and, of course, in clinical trials. Um, so I'll, I'll um, uh, just begin by briefly explaining the rationale behind using genetics to try to find therapeutic targets in um, uh, infection. Um, the first reason is that, that um, we're not all equally susceptible to infection. So it's not just being exposed to the pathogen that determines whether you'll get sick or not. There are other factors. And that's obvious for pretty much any infection in any population, human or animal, that I'm aware of that we've, that we've studied. If there's a big enough population, there's a very broad range of variation in susceptibility. Uh, I'm sure we could argue about where the, where the demarcations should be on this um, uh, spectrum, um, but based on seroprevalence data, um, a, a, a reasonable proportion of people who are exposed to COVID do not report symptoms despite becoming seropositive. Um, and averaged across all age groups, you know, um, depending on when we look, something like 1% of people who are exposed to COVID or sorry, rather exposed to SARS-CoV-2 um, develop uh, critical illness. Um, so this is a um, relatively unusual um, group of patients. Um, and um, of course, there are some uh, well understood risk factors. Um, the ISRIC 4 c score, um, you know, uses several of them to predict risk. Age is, of course, the largest. Um, but some of that risk, uh, some of that variation uh, in susceptibility is not explained by um, those uh, demographic factors. The other or the second reason uh, for um, using genetics uh, is that the immune system is really complicated. Um, the 
Um, we, we could probably argue with neuroscientists about what the most complicated system in the body is, um, but um, certainly more complicated than metabolism. And this is just an example of one of the metabolic pathways from the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes um, describing metabolic pathways in the liver. Um, unlike um, the, um, the steak that you had for your dinner last night that would have been processed through these metabolic pathways, your immune system um, has had to fight different um, pathogens um, each year or even less uh, of, of your existence um, and of your ancestors, whereas um, you know, our, our diet has changed a bit, but really not in a way that requires fundamental changes to our, um, our metabolism. But it's not just the fact that pathogens change, they also interfere. So there are plenty of examples, you know, even from SARS-CoV-2, that, that you know, the pathogens that, that are you know, a concern in medicine certainly everyone I've really looked at, um, has some way of interfering directly in the host immune response to um, interfere, to, to prevent us from, um, uh, from defending ourselves against them. Um, and so there's this arms race that constantly goes on between the host and, and uh, a range of different pathogens that cannot lead to anything other than a system, uh, an immune system that, that is a mire of, of complexity and redundancy. And I think that's the reason um, why we have failed singularly in, in intensive care medicine to find effective treatments based on um, our understanding of the immune system. Uh, particularly in sepsis, we've done 120 clinical trials. Last time um, a count was done in 2014. Um, that's phase two and three clinical trials, some of them costing tens of millions of dollars. And of course, in every single one of those cases, the investigators thought their therapy worked. And of those 120, literally none um, were effective. Um, so I think that's, that's an excellent hypothesis test to the question, do we understand? Uh, the pathophysiology of, of the disease we're treating. So genetics can help us to cut through that complexity and show us the, the levers in, in a uh, intractably complex system um, where intervention makes a difference. And we know that intervention makes a difference because, because we can see the effect of the gene. And then our only problem, although it's not trivial, is to then try to mitigate, uh, sorry, try to um, uh, create the same effect um, using uh, drugs to, um, to mitigate the um, organ damage caused by the immune response. And finally, um, uh, it's counterintuitive when you first look at it, but your, the, your chance of dying of an infection is very strongly inherited from parent to child. Um, we've, we've known that since the 1980s, and there are plenty of papers that robustly demonstrate it. And um, this is just my favourite. So this is from an adoption study where um, the investigators looked at um, people who were adopted and asked what was the effect of their parents' cause of death on the child's probability of dying from the same thing. So for cardiovascular disease, um, if you looked at the adoptive parents in blue, the people who brought you up but were not genetically related to you, um, if they died, uh, one of them died of a cardiovascular cause, then that increased your risk about threefold of dying of cardiovascular disease. Whereas if you had a biological parent in red who died uh, young, uh, below the age of 60, of a cardiovascular disease, then uh, you were four and a half times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease for cancer, the numbers the other way around. Um, but for infection, if your adoptive parent, that's the person you call mum or dad, who may even have coughed on you during their final illness, died young of an infection, then you're almost no more likely to die of an infection yourself than anyone else in the population. Whereas if your biological parent, someone you might never have met in your whole life, died of infection, then you're almost six times more likely to die of an infection yourself. So these are strongly heritable phenotypes, um, and that gives us reason to believe that studying them um, in the critically ill population, that extreme phenotype, the, the red end of that spectrum I showed you, um, might yield results. So it was a reasonable idea to, um, to start with. And of course, the aim was to, um, uh, the, you know, to, to um, uh, fulfill this conjecture that genetics can lead us to new treatments in, in critical illness. Um, and of course, at the time that, that wasn't proven, um, but um, I think we, we have now demonstrated at least the potential of that approach. So um, I'll show you the results of, of our first study shortly, um, but um, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we, we have now, I think, demonstrated um, based on um, the genetic findings that we made in 2020 that the paradigm works. Um, so this is a quote from the discussion of our paper from September 2020, this is the data from the first 2,244 patients with COVID and genomic, and we found a genetic association in a gene called type 2, um, and we had already um, 
uh, and a short list of nine drugs that Peter Horby had shared with us um, that were in the frame for consideration for inclusion and recovery based on clinical evidence. And at this time, there were a few small trials of paracetamib. Um, but based on this evidence, because we had a hit in one of the, the genes that was encodes a protein that's directly inhibited by paracetamib type 2, um, we um, put that drug to the top of the list. So it was um, in part because of genetic evidence um, that paracetamib was then included in the recovery trial. Um, and of course, um, I'm sure um, this audience knows that on Thursday of last week, the recovery trial reported that paracetamib is an effective treatment um, for COVID on top of um, steroids and tocilizumab. And I think the genetic evidence certainly um, pushed me towards um, including it, um, although that wasn't my decision. UT, UK CTAP and um, our chair, Charlotte Summers, were, were advising on that. Um, but then when, when it was put into recovery, um, we had to decide um, whether to add it to tocilizumab and steroids or use it on its own. Um, and there were, there were a, a diverse range of opinions. Um, I think I was at the more hawkish end on the basis that patients' lives were at, at was considerable risk. Um, and so um, uh, it was worth taking a, a greater risk by adding two monoclonals together, which is never done in rheumatology, I'm, I'm told. Um, so we did do that. Um, and I think the genetic evidence gave us a bit more confidence um, that that was probably the right thing to do. Um, and it's because of that, I think, that we've, that we've got a practice changing result because we've shown that baricitinib is effective, e equally effective whether, whether you're um, on tocilizumab and steroids, sorry, tocilizumab as well as steroids or just steroids. So um, uh, I think this, you know, as far as I know, for the first time in, in critical care medicine demonstrates the, the concept that we can go from genetic evidence um, to effective therapies of course, including biological and other clinical evidence um, in the decision-making. Um, so I'll tell you about the um, design of the study um, uh, with that intention in mind. There are lots of other things that we can find out using genetics, um, but of course, we're faced with a crisis, the immediate problem, um, it's how to treat these patients. And that, that has been and still is our focus. Um, the first, the first uh, of, the, of the two core elements of the design of genomic uh, is to recruit the right patients. Now, I showed you the extreme phenotype, um, that, that spectrum with the red line at the end, the, the 1 in 100 patients who end up in the intensive care unit. They are um, uh, a good comparison group because they're, they're very different from the rest of the population. So it's quite a strong comparison to, to compare them to everyone else. But it's not just because the, the, it's an extreme phenotype, I think, that genomic has been so successful at finding um, uh, robust genetic associations. Um, it's because that phenotype is quite um, clinically uniform. Um, and essentially, it's this group of people in the recovery dexamethasone result that we're they're recruiting. So the majority of them are on invasive ventilation. Um, and yeah, I'm sure this graph is familiar to everyone back, from back in 2020, um, showing that um, dexamethasone uh, was more effective um, in patients who were on a ventilator when they were randomized, um, indicating that they have, you know, I, I think quite convincingly, they have inflammatory, immune-mediated um, hypoxemic respiratory failure, and probably um, you know, hypoxia is on the causal pathway to death. And uh, by suppressing that, we're able to uh, improve their outcomes. So it's, it's that narrow um, clinical phenotype of by, by definition, by having been admitted to intensive care in the UK, relatively young, relatively free from significant comorbidities and frailty, um, and um, a single pathophysiological process, uh, um, inflammatory lung damage, um, that, that has meant that we've been able to um, uh, run such an efficient study. And, and just to quantify that a little for you, um, uh, we um, are seeing I'll show you, yesterday published 23 um, robust genetic associations with um, COVID, 16 of which, of which are new, um, in a study of 7,490 patients um, who are critically ill, whereas in a large international meta-analysis with more than 28,000 patients with a less well-defined phenotype, um, only three genetic associations were. Um, were discovered. So th that, that narrow clinical phenotype is, uh, is probably the most important thing. Um, and of course, the other end of it, as with any um, uh, clinical study of this type, is we need very large numbers. And that's thanks to the um, teams of research, uh, nurses and doctors um, who have been um, you know, really in extraordinary circumstances when everything else was in incredibly difficult in intensive care units. Um, taking the time and effort to um, obtain informed consent from patients and recruit them into the study. Um, and that's, that is the, the, the totality of the success of the study is that, that, um, that those people have selflessly um, 
uh, dedicated themselves to recruiting patients into the study and continue to do so. So as of today, we've got 18,219 patients in the study and we're working through genotyping them uh, now and I'm certain that we'll find more. In fact, I know we'll find more and I'll show you our, our hints to it in that direction at the end of the talk. So this is the first result um, we found in uh, September 2020, so um, five months after um, the first cases uh, arrived in the UK, we found uh, four new genetic associations. There are a few um, genetic associations that aren't that we we're not sure about here because they we, they didn't replicate in external studies. So that's why I say four. Um, I'll just orientate you to this graph um, because I'm going to show a few of these. Um, this shows um, every chromosome in the genome lined up um, from one to 22, and then X, and then later slides that number 23 will appear instead of X, but it's the same chromosome. Um, and there are 5 million spots on this graph, and each one is plotted um, such that its height indicates how sure we are that that single genetic variant, that you know, might be something where you have a T and I have an A um, at, at that position in the genetic code, um, uh, the height of the dots indicates how sure we are that that's really different between critically ill patients and uh, the population, the, the general population controls. So this is something that's, that's different about the crit critically ill population. Um, and the way we quantify that is with a, the negative log 10 p-value. So this red line indicates genome-wide significance after correcting for many different tests um, at a level, which is five times 10 to the minus eight. Um, and you can see here that this um, variant um, of chromosome three, which was actually already discovered, that was, that was discovered um, uh, about a month and a half before our, our paper um, by a Spanish and Italian study. Um, and it has a p-value in our study of almost 10 to the minus 30. Um, we'll, come, we'll come back and uh, just see how strong the p-value you can get for that um, in, a, in a second. But um, the four genes we found that were new and robustly replicated were OAS1, DPP9, type 2, and IFNR2. And type 2 is the one that, that led to daracitinib being included uh, in recovery. Um, and there were a couple of other genetic hints that, um, that helped to, you know, contributed a little to the decision to include dimethylfumarate in recovery as well. Um, uh, IFNR2 is the receptor for interferon, which was already at this time in the solidarity trial, and in fact did not improve outcomes that may even have caused harm. Um, okay, so on to the new stuff. Um, I'll just zoom in a little. Um, this is um, a paper that came out yesterday in Nature, um, reporting um, our most recent analysis of the genomic study in which we have found 23 um, genetic associations um, uh, crossing this genome-wide significance line and being replicated. Um, now, I'm not going to read every single one of them out. Um, I think that could get quite dull quite quickly, but there is a, a smorgasbord of interesting biology here. And to be perfectly honest, despite the fact that you know we've had these results for a few months and you know we've, we've been reading about them, um, uh, you know we really are. It, it's difficult to to dig into the biology of each of those. Uh, each of these new associations, um, and there's, you know, there is certainly um, important biological information that, that is highlighted by these associations that we have not identified because we don't have sufficient knowledge of the physiology. So, um, you know, we've, we've uh, published our findings and hope that the community will, um, uh, you know, bring bring those ideas forward. And there might well be therapeutic targets that we haven't identified that are that are flagged by these genes. Um, so, sixteen of these are new. Um, uh, I'll highlight a few, um, but um, I mean, you can see that you know now this is data from 7,490 patients um, compared with about 48,000 controls um, who were drawn from the um, 100,000 genome study. And unlike the previous study, the previous study we did super fast using a cheap, um, really quick technology called microarray genotyping. Uh, in this study, we used whole genome sequencing, which is much more expensive and, and slower, but does give us extremely good resolution on the genome um, and allows us to in include data from um, a broader range of genetic ancestries that aren't well covered by um, uh, the analysis methods for the other technology. So um, I think it certainly has led to at least one uh, discovery that we wouldn't have made otherwise. I think um, this hit here, which I'll show you uh, on the next slide in interferon alpha 10, um, it's quite a rare variant um, and um, uh, did depend on our ability to, I, I think, to use whole genome sequencing to find it. Um, so um, I'll, uh, we obviously we've shared our data. There's a table in the paper which um, reports all of the, um, the hits from this study. Um, so you can browse them at your leisure and I certainly encourage you to do so. And I think um, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty left um, to, be, uh, to be done on the interpretation of these results. Um, Often when we find a genetic association, 
um, what we actually see is a group of genetic variants that are you know, maybe 100 different variants that are nearby each other in the genome and tend to be inherited together through populations. And um, that's because when the genome rearranges itself, when you make gametes and in, in, um, uh, in, uh, testes or ovaries, um, the, the genome gets moved or gets, gets uh, uh, spliced up, um, but variants that are close to each other in a genome are less likely to be separated by that process. So they tend to be inherited together in, in quite complex patterns across populations. It's called linkage to equilibrium. So we tend to get a hit um, where we're not sure um, whether that actual variant is causing the genetic effect. We don't know that it's the one that's biologically important. Um, but a combination of the size of the study, um, the, in this case, certainly the use of whole genome sequencing, um, and maybe a bit of luck. Um, in several of the variants that we found, we can narrow it down to a single amino acid change. And um, now it's often, often the genetic associations aren't, aren't in proteins or aren't in, in um, protein coding sequences in the genome. Um, uh, but this one is, and, it, and it's really neat. So um, this is uh, interferon alpha 10. Um, you'll guess from the name, it's one of many subtypes of interferon alpha, the canonical host defense molecule. It's shown in green here in complex with ifnar1 and ifnar2, um, the two subunits of its receptor. Um, and this single amino acid here is changed in some people. It's quite a rare variant, um, less than 1% of the population have it, or sorry, just over 1% of the population have it. And if, if that amino acid is changed, we predict that the molecule would not fold properly. Um, and so the signal from interferon alpha 10 would be lost. Um, as far as we can see, just that one subtype of interferon, but that appears to be enough to increase your risk of um, uh, susceptibility to, to severe COVID. Um, so you know, one example where we've narrowed down to a single um, amino acid. Um, the other one from our um, data is uh, this um, variant, which I'm sorry, I'll just zoom out a little um, to, to let it show. Um, this is in a, in a gene called PLSCR1, and um, that stands for phospholipid scramblase 1. Looking at the literature, it seems that um, the consensus is that the primary role of this gene is not as a scramblase, but as a signaling molecule, um, which carries an interferon-stimulated message into the nucleus. Um, and there's a, um, a six amino acid non-canonical nuclear localization signal uh, in PLSCR1 that governs its interaction with uh, this blue protein importin. Um, and without that, if you disrupt, there's a paper, a lovely paper from a few years ago where they um, disrupted that one, you know, that, that six amino acid sequence and found that if it's disrupted, PLSCR1 is no longer translocated into the nucleus in response to inflammatory signaling. Um, and that's what we um, predict happens. Um, the amino acid highlighted here, and it will zoom in in just a second, um, uh, forms a hydrogen bond with important, um, and it's this amino acid here, um, which is substituted um, in patients who are, or rather in the variation, um, which confers greater susceptibility to COVID. Um, again, suggesting um, a similar mechanism, impaired interferon signaling is associated with um, more severe disease. Um, a few other highlights um, that, we, that we bring out in the paper, I think um, rather than just um, list these and, and, and speculate wildly about the biology, um, I'll, I'll just um, uh, tell you a few you know, the, these um, key highlights. So um, one is GMCSF. So we found a genetic association near the CSF2 gene that, that encodes GMCSF, which is, is granulocyte monocyte, um, sorry, granulocyte matrophage colony stimulating factor. Um, I, I, we were particularly struck to find this um, association. We're not certain just from the genetic data alone that that's the affected gene, although we're increasingly confident with later analyses that aren't in the paper. Um, but together with um, Peter Openshaw and Ryan Thwaites at Imperial, we published a paper in Science Immunology a year ago, and it's the only paper I've published on COVID that includes the name of a gene in the title, or rather the name of a protein in the title, uh, and the protein is GMCSF. We showed that um, increased concentrations in the plasma of GMCSF were um, associated with um, severe disease in COVID, and we speculated that it might be driving disease. Um, this genetic association increases my confidence that that might well be the case. Um, and of course, it's targetable um, with drugs that are on trials now. Um, we found two genes relating to blood clotting. That's the first time that these associations have been found, um, one in factor eight, um, and one in uh, uh, this gene PDGFRL, which is involved in platelet activation. Um, we narrowed down an association and showed that expression of mucin-1 is important in um, uh, susceptibility to COVID, or rather, we provide evidence that it is. Um, once we go from um, a single base genetic variant to making our conclusion about gene expression, there's a little bit of um, 
uncertainty comes in. But um, the variant that we showed was associated to COVID is also known to um, alter expression of mucin 1. And in fact, we um, uh, created a plot where we looked at um, the many variants that are known to alter how much mucin 1 is produced in um, in cells, you know, in, uh, in a dish, and that is to say RNA expression of, muc of mucin 1. Um, and almost linearly, every time you uh, move to the next variant that's associated with even greater expression, um, the uh, risk of, of severe disease increases. So um, I think that's, that's a very convincing um, uh, association between the expression of a gene rather than its protein coding sequence um, and disease, and suggests, sort of, that, you know, we have to, take, um, have to be a bit cautious about the interpretation, but it suggests that decreasing the amount of mucin 1 that's produced might improve outcome. And, and there are drugs that target mucin 1. Um, and finally, PDE4A, phosphodiesterase 4A. Here, the, the genetic prediction we make is um, uh, the opposite effect from the drug, but there are inhibitors of this phosphodiesterase that are in trials um, for um, a variety of, of diseases, including asthma. Um, uh, our, our first prediction from the genetics is um, it doesn't support, well, it, it suggests that the, the opposite effect is uh, beneficial, but um, as I said, there's uncertainty about the direction of effect from um, genetic predictions. Um, so I think that's a bit of biology that, that merits further examination. Um, and then, I mean, we can't fit all of these into a cartoon um, uh, without really getting into sort of wild conjecture, but I think um, this cartoon from a, a review in 2005 um, shows you know, uh, the canonical interferon signaling pathways. And it is quite striking that we have multiple associations um, in this pathway. So interferon alpha, one of them at least, uh, the FNR2 receptor subunit type two in our first um, uh, study. And in fact, there's a hint that CHAC1 is um, uh, significant as well in our unpublished analyses. Um, and then one of the inter, inter, in, uh, intracellular uh, signaling mechanisms, PLSCR1. Um, okay, so um, I, I thought since uh, this is such an esteemed audience and um, Charlotte and Mark have gone to such efforts to put together um, uh, um, a, you know, a great audience for this talk, I'd share with you uh, not just the data that we published yesterday, but data that we completed the analysis of um, last week and submitted to MedArchive. Um, so this is for our next paper. These data are um, under embargo just now, um, but um, this shows the effect of um, another few thousand genomic cases together with um, uh, some of the international cases that hadn't been included in their analysis so far from other elements of the genomic study, particularly Brazil, where Alex Pereira has recruited um, 4,000 cases and um, uh, collaborators in uh, Spain and, and Latin America in the Scourge Consortium who've contributed 3,000 cases and all the existing published data about COVID. And putting it all together, um, we see another 14 new associations um, that are robust um, um, cross the genome-wide significance threshold and, and meet our criteria for, um, for being robust uh, uh, associations. Um, and they include um, JAK1, um, which uh, you know, now in chromosome one is, is clearly crossing the genome-wide significance line. Um, and, a, and a few other um, uh, genes that I think are um, mechanistically very interesting, several involved in uh, monocyte macrophage um, differentiation, um, uh, this gene SLC2A5 and goes group five. And uh, when we discussed this at the SRIC 4C consortium meeting, Ryan Thwaites pointed out, um, uh, redistributes to the cell membrane during um, the monocyte to macrophage differentiation, um, facilitating fructose and glucose transport, which might well be related to the switch over to glycolytic metabolism. So that's one of several genes that are, that are um, associated with that um, maturation of um, uh, mononuclear cells. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, TMP RSS2, which is um, uh, important for proteolytic cleavage of, of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to facilitate its entry into cells. Um, and we see a strong signal in ACE2, which has actually already been reported by another group. Um, so, um, uh, you know, these are new data. They are now um, uh, available uh, on MedArchive. You can download our paper and have a look. Um, and um, we will be trying to work out what this means um, and submitting for publication shortly. Um, and there will be, be a few other analyses that we include in this. Um, I thought I would also share with you um, a wee bit of extra um, un unpublished data from the ISRIC 4C um, consortium because it's quite a neat signal. We asked a, a, a single question. This is not genetics, um, but um, uh, is, is a, another demonstration of the power of UK science to get um, 
uh, hard answers to important questions by recruiting very large numbers of patients across the whole NHS. Um, so from the 303,000 patients for whom we, we collected case report forms in this rate 4 c um, about uh, 6,000 have been tested for um, one of these three viruses. Um, and so we asked the question, if you are infected with COVID and you're also test positive for um, an adenovirus, an influenza virus or RSV, what does that do to your chance of um, requiring mechanical ventilation or dying? Um, and for instance, influenza, um, there's a very strong, robust signal, um, uh, no matter how we correct for it, um, for both an increased risk of mechanical ventilation or death. Um, and I think that you know this this simple answer should probably change our testing practice um, soon as flu becomes more common. It's going to become more more important to um, to recognise these patients um, and their increased risk. And so probably soon, whenever we test someone in hospital for COVID, we should also test them for flu. Um, I'll, I'll start to bring to a close by reflecting that um, we now have, and I, I love the fact that I have to update this slide very frequently, um, and I failed to do so um, based on this morning's MedArchive paper, um, because we're now um, over 40 genetic associations with COVID. Um, but, but published, um, there are 24 robust genetic associations with critical illness and COVID, um, and three uh, host-directed treatments that have been proven to reduce mortality, um, whereas in sepsis, we have none of either. Um, and I think that we should take from that um, two things. Firstly, um, you know, having one narrow diagnosis makes a massive difference to your ability to detect um, both of these kinds of signal. Um, and secondly, the methods that we've used to study COVID really work. Um, and so um, we should uh, continue this work um, to study the other diseases that, that kill people in critical care across the world uh, each year. So my final slide, I'll just show um, where we plan to take this um, in Edinburgh, and we're generously supported to do um, a lot of this work now. Um, the intention is, um, as, as I hope I've made clear, to go from genetics finding drug targets to um, validating them uh, in uh, clinical populations. And in some cases where we're really lucky, we can go straight from a genetic association uh, into large scale clinical trials. Um, in some cases, um, there's an intermediate step required um, where we understand the biology a bit more. And in diseases like sepsis, um, an opportunity to stratify the population using um, the one other really good source of causal inference in clinical medicine, other than clinical trials, which is genetics, because we, we know that people are randomly assigned to genotype at conception, and so we can infer the effect of that um, on their um, uh, response to disease. Um, so we can design trials using that ability of genetics to predict the, the effect of a drug. We can design a clinical trial in silico using genetics in, and find the exact right subpopulation of patients um, to test a therapy in. Um, and then using technology that Kev Daliwal, uh, my collaborator here in Edinburgh, and his team are developing, um, we are um, uh, already almost capable of delivering tiny doses of drug to, in fact, we already can deliver tiny doses of drug to um, a tiny um, uh, area of lung, um, navigating using an artificial intelligence driven bronchoscope, um, and then flooding the area with the drug, and, and then navigate back to the exact same place again in order to um, uh, infer the effect uh, of that drug on the pathophysiology of a disease, and particularly on gas exchange, the primary function of, of lung. So um, by doing that, we can, we can conduct what we are um, uh, calling micro trials, where we could conduct multiple different um, tests of different um, therapeutic interventions in, in tiny areas of lung at minimal risk to the patient um, and infer which um, drugs are most likely to be effective in humans with the actual disease that we're, that we're planning to treat. And so I hope accelerate the prioritization of, um, of drug candidates um, and get them into trials more quickly. I'll stop there. Um, I think I've left enough time for, for questions and discussion. Um, I must thank uh, the people who contributed most to this work. Um, the uh, co-authors on, on our papers are listed at the top here, but also, um, most importantly, the um, research teams across the country who recruited patients into the study, whose names are scrolling across the screen. There are more than 1,400 of them. Um, they worked incredibly hard um, recruiting, you know, in many cases, almost every eligible patient in an intensive care unit, even during the peak of the pandemic. Um, and of course, that is the entire reason why um, uh, this work has succeeded. Um, and of course, um, I must thank uh, the many funders um, of, the, of the project who I won't list, but their logos were shown on the slides uh, and the patients themselves who volunteered to contribute.